Hello, beloved, and welcome to Bible Bits with me, Pastor Will. Thank you so much for tuning in. Each week, we're taking a few minutes to explore a major story or theme in the scriptures and try to break them down to understand what it says about God, what it means for you and me, and how it fits into the overall narrative of scripture. Now, last week, we entered the promised land with the Israelites. We saw how Joshua led them as a commander in conquering the land and dividing it among the 12 tribes. We saw the pattern of apostasy and repentance that occurred in the time of the judges. And we saw the people cry out for a king to lead them. And Saul became the first king of Israel. As we followed this progression from a loose confederation to a unified nation, we saw that God continued to be present with the people, both when they were faithful and when they were not. And even as God was with them and cared for them, we also saw that sometimes the most devastating punishment God laid on the people was to let them have their way and allow them to reap the natural consequences of their attitudes and actions. Now, by the end of our story last week, Saul had been rejected by God as king over Israel because of his arrogance and his disobedience. But even though God rejected Saul's kingship, Saul remained in authority politically while God chose a new king. A boy named David would find God's favor. And God would make this young shepherd boy into a mighty warrior, a prolific prophet, a poet, and a wise ruler. David is typically held up as the greatest of Israel's kings, and just as Moses was lifted up as a priestly archetype of the coming Messiah, so David will be considered the kingly archetype of the Messiah. But as we'll see, even David is not without his flaws. Now, David's story begins in 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord tells the prophet Samuel to anoint a new king in Saul's place and sends Samuel to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse. Jesse has eight sons, and he brings the first seven before the prophet, but none of them is chosen. So finally, Jesse sends for his youngest son, David, who is in the fields tending the sheep. When David comes before the prophet, the Lord reveals that this is the one who has been chosen to be king, and Samuel anoints David. In the latter half of this chapter, we're told that the spirit of the Lord had left Saul and an evil spirit had come to torment him. His advisors recommend that he find someone to soothe him with music, and one says that he knows of David, the son of Jesse, as someone skilled with the lyre and a strong warrior to boot. And so David comes into Saul's court as the king's armor bearer, and whenever Saul is tormented by an evil spirit, David plays his lyre to bring Saul peace. In chapter 17, we find that the Israelites are at war with the Philistines, and the Philistines send forth a champion named Goliath, who is said to be six cubits and a span tall. And that would be roughly equivalent to about nine feet, nine inches tall. And more than just being incredibly large, the giant is well-armed and well-trained as a warrior. He challenges Israel to send a champion out to face him in single combat, but no one is willing to do that. That is, until David arrives. He comes bringing provisions for his brothers who are in the army, having been sent by their father. But he hears the giant challenging the Israelites and insulting the Lord, and so David offers to fight the Philistine. He tells the king of how he has killed lions and bears as he was keeping his father's sheep, and that he is confident that the God who gave him the strength to defeat lions and bears will give him power over this enemy as well. Saul gives David his own armor, but the boy is unaccustomed to the heavy equipment. And so he leaves the armor and goes to face the giant armed with his staff, a sling, and five smooth stones. The giant taunts him, but David stands unafraid 
And as the two combatants come toward each other, David slings a stone into Goliath's forehead, killing the giant. He draws the giant's own sword and cuts off his head, and the armies of Israel give chase and conquer the Philistines. From that time, David comes into Saul's court on a permanent basis. But it doesn't take long for Saul to begin to hate David. David forms a close kinship with Saul's son, Jonathan, and the two love each other dearly. And soon, Saul gives David one of his own daughters as a wife. But all along, Saul is looking for a way to kill David. He makes David a commander in the army, hoping David will fall in battle. But the Lord is with David and grants him military success. Eventually, it becomes necessary for David to flee from Saul's court. He goes into hiding among the Philistines. He pretends to be raving mad. And on two occasions, David has the opportunity to kill Saul. But he refuses to do so, because Saul is still the king, the Lord's anointed. In 1 Samuel 31, Saul and his son Jonathan are killed in battle. And with the death of Saul, David is made king over Judah. This takes place in 2 Samuel chapter 1. And by chapter 5, David has become king over all Israel. David makes Jerusalem the capital of the nation. And in chapter 6, he brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. 2 Samuel chapter 7 tells us that David had intended to build a temple for the Lord in Jerusalem. But the prophet Nathan tells David that it will not be him, but rather his son who will build a temple for the Lord. Even so, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God makes a promise to David to establish a house for David forever. And so it's said that the Messiah who will come is a descendant of David, a member of this royal house. Now, 2 Samuel chapter 11 tells the story of David and Bathsheba. One spring, David sends his armies out to do battle with the Ammonites, but he remains back in Jerusalem. And as he's wandering on the roof of the palace, David sees a woman named Bathsheba while she is bathing. He sends for the woman. They become intimate. It's not mentioned whether this is with or without her consent. And Bathsheba conceives. But there's a problem. Bathsheba is the wife of a man named Uriah, who is a soldier in David's army. David sends for Uriah, who comes back to Jerusalem. And David intends to have Uriah sleep with his wife and maybe be able to pass off the child of his affair as Uriah's own. But Uriah refuses the comforts of home while his brothers in arms are in the field. So when David sends him back to the front, he sends along orders for Uriah to be sent to the heaviest part of the fighting and then to have the rest of the troops pulled back so that Uriah will die in battle. And when Uriah dies, David takes Bathsheba as his wife. The prophet Nathan confronts David in his sin. He tells him a story about a rich man who stole his poor neighbor's only beloved lamb and killed it to make a feast for a guest, even though the rich man had many flocks. David declares that the actions of this person are abhorrent, and such a person deserves to die, and the prophet reveals that he's speaking of David's affair with Uriah's wife and the subsequent killing of Uriah. David repents of his sin, but the child they had conceived becomes ill and dies. After they mourn the child, David and Bathsheba have another child, whom they name Solomon, and Solomon is going to be the one who will carry on David's legacy. Now, for the remainder of David's reign, there are going to be problems in the kingdom. They begin with David's son Amnon raping his half-sister Tamar. 
another of David's sons, Absalom, kills Amnon and then revolts against his father's rule. When Absalom is killed, even though he had been opposed to David, David grieves deeply for his son. And then when David is old, his son Adonijah declares himself king in the place of his father. But Bathsheba and the prophet Nathan come and secure David's blessing for Solomon to be his successor. Ultimately, David dies at the age of 70, having ruled as king over Israel for 40 years. Now, there are absolutely many stories that we've glossed over in First and Second Samuel, dealing with David's life, especially the latter part of it. But rather than getting deeper into those, I want to take a few minutes to talk about the Psalms. When we're first introduced to David, he's lifted up both as a great warrior, but also as a great musician. And nearly half of the 150 Psalms found in the book of that name come with a heading that identify them as Psalms of David. Now we should point out that these headings are late additions, so the attribution of these psalms to David is more tradition than it is historicity. That said, it's worth spending some time looking at the psalms, as they are a rather unique genre within the canon of scripture. The psalms are a collection of prayers and songs that are mostly written in the first person perspective. Some of these seem to have devotional use associated with certain festivals or offerings or with pilgrimages to the temple and the worship therein. But other psalms seem to be personal prayers. There are psalms of lament that bemoan the circumstances in which the psalmist finds themselves, such as Psalm 13, which begins, How long, O Lord, did you forget me forever? Or Psalm 22, which begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There are psalms of praise that lift up God's goodness and faithfulness and majesty, including the last five psalms, Psalm 146 through 150, all of which begin with the Hebrew word hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. There are instructional psalms, like Psalm 1, that speak of the way of righteousness as opposed to the way of wickedness. Some psalms are especially artistic, and Psalm 119 stands out as one of those. It's an instructional psalm, but in the original Hebrew, it is written as an acrostic poem with 22 sections, each of eight verses. And each verse within these sections begins with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet, so that verses 1 through 8 all begin with Aleph, verses 9 through 16 begin with Bet, and so on and so forth. Now, while many of these psalms are attributed to David, some come with a specific mention of an event, like Psalm 51, which is said to be a response to Nathan confronting David about his affair with Bathsheba. And again, what's really remarkable about the book of Psalms is that unlike the narratives and the histories that tell us about what God is doing, or say the epistles in the New Testament that teach us about God's grace, these Psalms tell us directly how the psalmist feels about God. They express the psalmist's hopes and fears, griefs and joys, doubts and trust. And because they are so deeply personal, the Psalms are often easier for readers to relate to, and they remain an important part of worship for many Christians. Well, friends, that's where we're going to leave off for today. Again, there are a number of stories that we're not delving into, dealing with David's life and kingship, and First and Second Samuel are wonderful reads for that narrative. We see in David, the great king of Israel and the model for a political Messiah, a man who walks in righteousness and yet is still a flawed human being. As with every other giant of faith that we've encountered, David is not perfect 
so much as he is faithful. Next week, we'll turn our attention to David's son Solomon, the wisest of the kings, and we'll explore some of the teachings attributed to him. Until then, beloved, may God bless you and keep you. Amen.